We are here for an exclusive interview with Jeff Den Denworth, who's this co-founder of Vast Data. You just saw their stream. They kicked off a lot of great news, exciting frontier-like execution around the future of AI. Jeff, great to see you. Congrats on the news and everything you guys got going on. It's a rocket ship, the Vastronauts, as you guys call your, your employees and staff. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, pretty pretty crazy times for us. So Cosmos has just had, you guys just did your presentation. Jensen Wong was on there from NVIDIA. Yeah. You know, he is so authentic, but he really um, highlights the relationship with NVIDIA and Vast, and that was a big part of the news. Uh, you guys have that product now integrated with NVIDIA. He talks about this next great adventure of AI, this frontier that you're both on. But one of the things that stuck out at me, and I want to get your reaction right out of the gate here is, it's an eight and a half year relationship with NVIDIA. Yeah. And a lot of people are jumping on the NVIDIA bandwagon now. And, and so, you know, oh, NVIDIA stock's high. And they're, they're, the, they're the proxy for this next bridge to the future, right? And this is clear, certainly from a financial performance standpoint, stock price. But you go back eight and a half years ago, it was not obvious to everybody what was going on around metadata and this new computing paradigm, which even Mark Zuckerberg was quoted this week in saying that this has yet been capped in terms of capability where compute used to be you know, finite and have constraints. Now we're on a whole nother adventure, kind of your tagline here. Yeah. What's your reaction to that and how, and how do you explain the, the, the th theory back then and obviously it's playing out beautifully for you guys? Well, it's, it's pretty wild to think that you can just spend money on intelligence now, right? You know, that, that wasn't something that we could do in the past. And so, you know, organizations like Meta are, are kind of jumping onto that to make their services a lot smarter. Um, if you go back eight and a half years, uh, you know, the, the vast idea was not possible without NVIDIA. Um, we started in the early days by working with some of the advanced networking concepts that their team was developing. Uh, and then following that, we've, we've, we've got so many different integration points and different areas that we collaborate. Um, and, and, and when we started the company, we, you know, Renan and I were, were talking about companies like Thinking Machines, if you go back. Yeah. Uh, and, and we had this idea that as deep learning took, took hold in the market, that it would be possible to build machines that can start to think for themselves. But, you know, when you start a business in 2016 or so, uh, betting the farm on deep learning was a little bit premature. So we just started building out enterprise infrastructure using technologies like what comes from NVIDIA. And then over time, um, you know, obviously everything now is, is exploding because people are realizing the power of deep learning. On a personal level, you must feel like as a team, you guys made that bet. I mean, thinking machines for the folks who don't know was kind of the beginning of supercomputing yeah. you know, systems. Uh, big iron, as it used to be called, not the mainframes, but as you got into the more of those specialized systems, HPC, high performance computing. I, Jensen's Jensen's vision of democratizing supercomputing is playing out. That bet has come in. It it well, yes and no, I would say. Um, so so supercomputers are being democratized for training, right? And and uh, earlier we announced that we're working with the XAI team on some of the stuff that they're doing uh, to train Grok, right? And these are just like fantastically large systems that we get to work with. But um, every time I meet with a CIO or a chief data officer for uh, let's say a Fortune 1000 class company, they ask me the same question all the time after we show them the platform. They say, your database, does it support uh, vectors and mm -hmm. can I do vector search on it? And really what that individual is telling me is that they are still very early in their journey towards bringing in AI agents and um, pumping all of their enterprise data through them to make yeah. their business run faster. So, you know, I agree with Zuckerberg, which is, you know, we're still in the early, early days of large scale AI adoption. And I think NVIDIA, I don't know if you're tracking that, I didn't catch the last earnings report, but you know, maybe 50% of their business is coming from inference, which means we're still making the model smarter and then once we do that, then you could imagine like a thousand times larger market opportunity for inference. Yeah, I love that. I love that um, metaphor you use about training. You're kind of in school. I don't think you use the school analogy, but I've never heard him say that before. We say it on the cube. You train, you go to school, and then you get out of school, then you infer and reason from that yeah. knowledge. You go back a little bit for classes. That's reinforced learning, fine tuning. That's a human thing. Jensen actually mentioned that LLMs will, and, and foundation models will start to think for themselves, and what I love about any quote he said, um, AI is the first invention that invents new versions of itself, yeah. and that's where agents come in. So you bring in the fact that this is now, that trend is obvious, and you've got a developer market that's frenzying right now on op open, open source software. You look at Hugging Face, I mean, they got zillions of models now 
So the developers are hungry. Yeah. The data now is kind of being identified as, hey, metadata is still great. The secret, secret sauce is metadata, which you guys have been part of. This is the big part of the news of Insight Engine, the community you're putting together, those are the two big elements of your news. And the fact that you got the NVIDIA partnership kind of ties it together because you can see where the platform comes in. You guys were unpack all that for us because this is where, I think this is a killer point on the trend here because as agents do come in and they will come in, agents, yep. sub-agents, we've been chronicling that in the Cube Research. This is a key part of your news today. So if you think about it, there's, um, there's two problems that, that hold enterprises back from using large scale AI across the business. The first is um, a model can't be trained with all of an organization's business. I was with a Fortune 10 customer the other day. They said, we probably have about 100 petabytes of unique data, right? GPT-3, just to give you a comparison, was trained on like 45 terabytes. And so there's just more data sitting within an organization than what can be cost effectively trained within a model. Second thing is, when you train a model on any amount of data, the thing that it can't do is preserve the security policies on that data that it was trained on. So if you and I get the same model and then you know, we have different permissions at the, at the source data level, it doesn't come through. And so um, the, the way that we, we saw this is that there was an opportunity to make um, what's called RAG or AI retrieval a lot more uh, simple to deploy across the enterprise. And, and um, it starts with unstructured data, which has always been our specialization. And if you, you, you use the term metadata, and I, I really like that because I think, you know, there are different ways to approach retrieval, but at the end of the day, what's happening is that file systems are just evolving, right? And if you think about it, um, you know, you, you now have another form of metadata in the form of vectors that makes your data conversational. When you go down to your, your source data, you can get answers out of that data, not just lists of files or things like that. You've got a, a laptop here that presents all the files to you, but it doesn't say what's in those files. and doesn't allow you to just run an LLM to ask questions to that data. And that's what's happening. So, you know, for 40 years, you've had structured and unstructured data. The unstructured data is 20 times larger than the structured data market that sits in like enterprise data warehouses and databases. Well, let's suppose that over the next couple of years, the unstructured data industry will disappear. Why is that? Because now you can query on all of your data, right? And, and, and I think it's just a massive opportunity for organizations to unlock their data. I mean, data should just be vanilla. Just data's out there and right. what form is kind of abstracted away. Data and metadata in the form of indexes and additional tokens and things like that. You know, we've been, been doing the queue for 15 years, as you know, and Dave Vellante and I always talk about metadata because that was the key to storage, file systems and having data about data. Yep. Um, and when you guys talk about the vector embeds and this ret AI retrieval, which is basically a better word than uh, RAG, which is retrieval augmentation generation, which is an industry term, which by the way is the killer app right now. Yes. Um, and all new trends have a killer app right out of the gate, which is essentially search in this case, but there's more coming. So vector embeds is metadata. Yep. Okay, in a new format, neural network, whatever you want to call it, it's not the old way, but it's still new data. It's still, it's still something that will scale. And I think this is where I think the Jensen tie into um, LLMs reinventing themselves or uh, technology that will reinvent itself because the agents will get smarter. So this is where the inference kind of crosses over yes. the causal AI right around the corner. Other trends that, that are out there are just evolving. So we, it's going to take time, but you got to get it in the right format. So what you guys have presented, I think what I see is the metadata piece of the new format. And that's where AI also comes in because you have embedding models which are basically uh, LLMs and large video models and other types of models that understand unstructured data that can now read through your source data and, and create descriptions of that data in the form of a vector. Um, and so that was a big part of it. And the Insight Engine basically puts us together with NVIDIA where our software now supports deployment on GPU-based systems with um, what are called NIMS, which are NVIDIA Inference Microservices. Mm -hmm. You have NIMS for video, you have NIMS for text, you have NIMS for proteins and other like bioinformatic data. It's going to be crazy. And if you look at the exponential rate of improvement for all these new AI inference models, that all then just gets directed towards your enterprise data and allows you to get a lot smarter about what's inside of it. But the other thing that we announced, and this is kind of a quiet one, but I think it's um, as radical of a change in the market as, as the earlier part, is we now support for the vast database um, a Kafka broker. And so if you think about it, forever you've had data warehouses where you kind of put your analytics data, and then you have your event buses where you put all of your kind of real-time data streams, and then you try to get one from the one to the other. And so what if you could just like stream directly into your data warehouse to the tune of millions of inserts per second? 
Now you can correlate everything within uh, your environment. And if you can expose that all to LLMs and to retrievers, then it gets really interesting for basically just opening up your business uh, using AI. I think, I think the big uh, innovation is that it's disruptive. I mean, you're disrupting features that were companies. Yes. Now they become features. Yes. We're starting to see this new kind of reconstitution of value in the tech stack as well as process. Yes. Two things happening at the same time. Process improvement's hard enough. Never mind adopting a new tech stack that might make a company you work with a feature of something else. What's, what's your reaction to that? Because I've never seen it in my career, this happening at the same time, a front end process improvement and back end implementation so radical and so transformative. We think about trade offs all day long. Uh, and if you kind of look at that tech stack that you're talking about, so many different products represent some trade off around scale or performance or transactions or analytics and things like this. And we built this new architecture that just allows us to not even worry or think about that stuff. Uh, and so as a result, we take the opportunity to make things more real time and to make them more efficient so that customers don't have to deal with that complexity. Um, but complexity is still a big thing. That's where Cosmos comes in, yeah. right? And so, um, so today we're also announcing this, this community of um, AI data and infrastructure practitioners that can come together and share best practices. And we bring together a lot of vendors, a lot of users, even, even like venture capitalists are coming into this community to start to build this kind of AI ecosystem that will help move us all forward a lot quicker. And there's only so much that VAS can simplify, mm -hmm. but we all really need to work together to, to make it better for everybody. You know, it's interesting when you have horizontal disruption that's innovative, mm -hmm. community is critical. How, how can people get involved in this community? Is there have you guys thought about the onboarding yet? Is it open? How do people get involved? Yeah, so we um, we hired a gentleman by the name of Jonas Roslin to to um, to actually be the con the community facilitator, uh, and and he's he's great. He's worked with a lot of very popular communities in the past, um, and we're building out all these different platforms where people come in. Uh, so, for example, we have like Discourse and Discord server, and we have um, all sorts of other different venues that yeah. that organizations can jump into and immediately start just sharing knowledge. Um, then on top of that, we have both uh, virtual and physical events that we're going to be hosting throughout the course of the next couple of years to, to just bring people together, to yeah. force them to, to share in insights. And that aligns obviously with the open source community. Again, it's collaborative sport. And I want to get back to retrieval, AI retrieval, which I love the term, by the way, because yeah. RAG is the industry term, it's the killer app. Um, but some people will say, hey, you know, RAG's not really AI. All it is is vector embeds. That's been around for a while. Uh, I, I, my answer to that is, no, it's the first use case where there's value being created. And I think the agent thing that ties next, and I want to get your thoughts on where retrieval and agents play together because essentially faster knowledge sharing and decision-making has been some of the benefits of the productivity we're seeing in AI, yes. right? So AI retrieval sets the table. So how do you connect uh, the dots between AI retrieval, which a lot of people are getting the vector embed format, the yes. metadata for AI, if you will, RAG's an easy, low-hanging use case. It is. Fruit use case. Agents are right around the corner. Obviously, Salesforce is betting the ranch on agent force, things like that. So you're starting to see people making the, not pivot, but extension to their value. Where does uh, AI retrieval and agents connect? So um, there are two parts where AI comes into the retrieval process. First, you, you, you pointed out, vector databases are not new, right? They've been around for a very long time. Um, and, and similarity search, which is how you search through uh, adjacent vectors is, is also, you know, for example, VAS has been working with similarity algorithms for eight years now in terms of just doing that for data reduction. Um, but in order to, to create a vector, you need something that understands data, right? And that's where AI first comes in. You have uh, LLMs and protein models and, and um, video models that all start to understand data and create those vector signatures that then have to go into a database. Um, and then you have the second one, which is an agent that basically you can um, use as a, as a translator, right? LLMs can take uh, what, a, what a user may ask and then turn that into a vector search op operation or a text to SQL operation. So LLMs, um, you know, obviously take a lot to train. So you can't say that there's no AI in that part of the process. Uh, but it's a pretty pedestrian use case anymore because we've all been using LLM so much that it's just part of our everyday life. We forget how much AI is, is embedded into that. So yeah, they're used for search, but there's two forms of AI that are really, really hard to build that are deeply embedded into that. And when you look at the data infrastructure, one of the things we've loved about when you guys launched with us on theCUBE a year ago, and again, the results have been great on the vast side is, is that 
it's a new data infrastructure for the next generation AI. That was kind of like what we saw. Now you got the data engine, you got Insight Engine, you got the deal with NVIDIA kind of tied in, integrated in. Yep. LLMs will talk to each other. We, we predicted that on our CUBE research and our power law. How do you guys see this differentiating in the marketplace? Because you mentioned you had scale on, I think it was trillion transactions you mentioned on your keynote there. What's the differentiation versus the competition? How would you answer that question? I think it's a definition of real time, right? So, um, so first we think about retrieval as, okay, a human has asked a question to some complex data source, you get an answer back. That kind of makes sense. But as you pointed out, agents that are chaining with agents means that businesses are going to start working in GPU time, right? And at that point, um, I don't think that you can, you can abide a lot of stale data. And so if you think about the way that retrieval engines have been built today or data warehouses, you always have some other source data that has to be like um, periodically indexed back into where you're asking your questions to. That doesn't work for us. Um, the way that we see it is we don't want AI agents to ever be exposed to any stale data or any stale permissions data so that CISOs are happy, you're always secure, but businesses are powered by real-time data all the time. And that could only be done by building a transactional vector database, a transactional data warehouse, and a unstructured data store that is um, kind of um, coupled with a runtime and a triggering system such that every piece of data that flows into the system is instantaneously indexed and then updated into this vector database that ultimately LLMs can then go ask questions to. Uh, and that's never been done before. And the reason it hasn't been done is because architectures up until VAST were never designed for scale and transactionality. Yes, yeah, so Renan talking about the community piece and how there's a lot of collaboration around these use cases. Um, we'll get to the enterprise side of it, how they adopt it and what the best practices are. But I want to get your thoughts on that whole model being stale kind of approach. You mentioned that again in the keynote. Um, Recency and relevance are the two se seem to be the key variables right now in yes. this conversation. And that's also ties to the governance piece, which I think is an offensive opportunity for companies to use that, not be defensive with, with, with uh, governance, but use it as an offensive way to move the needle on value. Compliance, I call it defense. It's like, you got to play defense with compliance, do the reporting. But you know, you got this idea that I got I to have to make sure the data is recent and relevant. Yeah. What's your reaction to that? How would you explain that to a, to a customer as who's got all this 3D chess going on in their, their reset as they think about AI? So a user stores a file called passwords <laughs> and then um, nobody notices and the AI engine goes and does a training or, or fine tuning on that data. Uh, and then indexes that data. Uh, let's say if it can't be fine tuned and it indexes that data into a vector database. So you have the answers already in your vector database. Somebody realizes that happens and they say, okay, go delete that file ASAP. Now, because of retrieval, you also have to go and re-index your vector database. And if that's not directly tied into your source data, that becomes uh, a problem where you do have a defensive problem, I think. Uh, and so we basically said- You mean on the governance side? You yeah, got for sure, for sure, right? It's a huge uh, risk window that gets created for organizations. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of the problematic uh, use case, which is, okay, I've got a lot of data that I didn't mean to train or index into a vector database. And, uh, and, and so that has to be resolved, which we have. Um, but the second thing that needs to be resolved is, okay, so you've got business decisions that are being made through these AI agents that you've created. And if they don't have recency of data, then they're always seeing some sort of historical look of an organization. And, that doesn't work if you want to basically power a business with real time for recommenders or for um, security systems or for anything that, that needs real time data. It's never been a problem that's been solved until VAST. You know, one of the things that's come up, we've talked about vector embeds and we've been doing our cube AI ourselves, we're playing with our small little, little model. But when I talk to um, big customers, they, they think about scale. Yes. And then they think about, okay, architecture for a foundational kind of rebooting IT but it's not IT in the old way, it's kind of the new IT. Uh, and they think, okay, what do I got to do? So there's a little bit of guardrail mentality. It's very DevOps-like. And I want to get your thoughts on how you're experiencing the customers because when they go look at AI, they don't want to think about vector embeds because that's not what they're trying to solve. They're trying to solve a, a, a large scale distributed computing infrastructure problem of how do I set the table for the agents that are going to be coming in on board and or any new application. I mean, it's, we're seeing scalable apps doing stuff with climate that we've never seen before. Yeah. Uh, for example, Climate Week last week in New York, the big conversation was I'm using cloud technology and large scale data sets 
That was an ungettable application just five years ago. Yeah. Now you have SaaS apps being agentic enabled. That's going to be innovation. So the top of the stack looks like it's, it's coming together. I don't really, I just want to make sure my stuff works. And that's most of the mindset of the top uh, companies we talk to. So we, we, we've been doing a lot of customer discovery uh, as, we, as we start to build in vector capabilities into the platform. Uh, and, and I remember we had a call the other day with one of the more popular uh, SaaS applications that's used AI to kind of understand data. Uh, and, and they said, we're going to tell you all the goods and all the bads about every vector product that we've worked with. And at the end of the call, they said, we don't want to ever deal with this again. <laughs> and so I think that's true, right? And, and if you think about this as advanced forms of metadata um, that are redefining unstructured data systems, then it is basically something that customers shouldn't have to deal with. Let's zoom out for a second. Let's talk about uh, your role as a company as co-founder. I know for a fact we, we see each other all the time at the key events. We do. Um, I know you're always booked in meetings. So what is the common day in the life? What, uh, create the high order bit of what the conversation is like with the consistent conversation you're having with people trying to build this next generation adventure with AI and actually getting it right. What, what are some of the conversations you're having? What are the key issues? And what's the key innovation that you guys are presenting? So I, I think it's fair to say we have two types of customers. Um, we have the foundation model builders that think about just fantastically large scale. Yeah. Uh, CoreWeave was part of the, the Cosmos event and um, we've been fortunate to partner with them for over a year now and, and these guys are building the big of the big, right? And so they don't really worry as much about enterprise deployment of AI across their pre-existing data sets. They're building for tomorrow. Uh, but then we have uh, essentially the Fortune 5000 that we work with alongside those organizations that are taking the models that come from them and deploying them or, or starting to deploy them at, um, at some level of modest scale. And so here, uh, I think it's still very much experimentation. Uh, I don't know what your perspective is, but it's, it's yeah. just really, really early. Uh, and what's happening is that as you kind of go down this rabbit hole, people are realizing that the amount of tools that are required to go and put in this new plumbing is way more than what people would have expected. And so, um, so we're, we're, we're every day working to minimize the number of tools that they have to deploy by just putting more and more capability into the platform. Yeah. Uh, and the constant term that keeps coming back is AI readiness. And I don't think everybody totally understands what that means, yeah. but they just want to be ready to react to a line of business or something like that that comes in that has some crazy idea that can move their business forward so much faster. It's just, we were talking about this research team about the, this point about what's the, what do we see. It's interesting because there's different perspectives. The, the most common perspective we see, and I want to get your reaction to this, is that you know, there was a phrase, I forget who said it on theCUBE, Innov our innovation strategy is driven by our constraints. And if you look at the constraints right now in the market, the infrastructure capabilities from compute, GPUs are getting stronger and faster, so to see infrastructure uh, increase in performance. The data layer is an area where people are really trying to get their, just get their house in order. So there's yeah. a lot of that, that going on. And then the, at the top of the stack, like I said, there's a huge developer frenzy, okay? And the agentic wave is here. Yeah. So I think people see clearly like, okay, agents will be part of it because they can just, do the math in their head and saying, wow, I can just automate this, I'm more productive so they can connect the dots on the value proposition of what the app will look like. But when they, <laughs> they turn internally, they go, wait a minute, we have all these silos. Like, so yeah, it yeah. becomes kind of like, okay, a whole nother infrastructure kind of resetting of the foundation of what's capable. So we're kind of in this kind of this tipping point. Do you agree with that? I mean, is that consistent or? Computationally, you have capital constraints. You have power constraints, you have space constraints in certain cases, and so um, there is very much a conversation that's happening right now about cloud, uh, a next generation cloud. Is, you know, uh, Jensen said to me once, he said, if, and I won't name the customer, he's like, think about these guys, um, they're never going to have a data center with uh, 10 megawatts of power that they can just use for um, new GPUs. So, so they have to go to cloud, right? And, and what's happening is the cloud market is responding to this really quickly, um, and, and Vast is powering the next generation cloud with this multi-tenant capability. But the question then is, well, all my data's over here, and now you're telling me to put my machines over here, what do I do? Uh, and, and that's why we built something called the Vast Data Space, which is this new ability to kind of federate all the different places that you compute. So you can keep your data here, but compute on it here. Uh, and, and the term oftentimes comes up with data gravity. And I think we've solved for data gravity 
uh, because customers can't solve for power gravity. Uh, and, 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 and that seems to be the, the kind of the big sticking point right now that most organizations deal with uh, outside of the developer problem, which we don't, we don't really work in. Well, the big much. news is the inside engine and obviously the community piece that you guys are announcing. Again, those things go hand in hand, it's one-two punch. Um, NVIDIA, obviously, Jensen Wong with Renan was a great part of the presentation. Um, he's great because he's not scripted. He just off the cuff. He's like, it's amazing. he'll play whatever music is on, but it's always about AI and all frontier. And talk about the relationship with NVIDIA because I think this is important, speaks to some of the things you're talking about, which is obviously they're looking at not just serving those big customers. Yeah. They also looking at the enterprise. They see NIMS, their, their piece. What, what part of the platform, take us through the, what the relationship with NVIDIA is obviously eight and a half years, but on this news, what's the innovation, what's the key element of the NVIDIA platform that's accelerating your growth? Sure, uh, NVIDIA likes to use the word real time as much as we do, uh, because they <laughs> see that requirement from customers. And so what we've done is um, uh, about, I don't know, maybe um, around GTC time, so I'm going back to March or so, we started having conversations about how our platform can be extended. And if you think about this, not as a storage system, not as a database system, but rather just like a data flow computer, then um, what they realized is that there would be an opportunity to actually not just do fast search through a data set, but rather to do fast search on a data set that has ultimate recency, to use your, your, your point. Uh, and so, so, um, so the first thing they did is they exposed this to their NIMS agenda, and now you can deploy those in vast systems using us as basically the runtime or operating system for AI. Um, the machines that, that deploy these NIMS obviously need to be powered by high performance NVIDIA GPUs. So we've added support for that within our system. And then what you have is enterprise infrastructure with all the enterprise features, both from a file management and from a database management perspective that you can deploy at massive scale for that consolidation point that you talked about earlier. Um, now with all this NVIDIA instrumentation and software that just runs directly in the system and is deployed by the system. And so, um, so this is big for them because you know, from a partnership perspective, they think, okay, the next big hill we need to climb is enterprise. And if you look across the enterprise, you just have legacy systems that aren't designed for this level of, um, of processing and reprocessing. So yesterday I was talking on Slack to the team and I, I, I used the term um, retain to retrain. And if you think about that, like data retention, uh, as, as these embedding models get better and better, it's going to be the key to making organizations smarter because now you just have this massive corpus that you can just go train and retrain on all the time. Uh, and I think NVIDIA is excited for that. They now have an infrastructure partner that can, can match to the scale and ambition that they have. I love that retain to retrain. I think that points to the wave we're on. And my final comment I want to get your thoughts on is, is that if you look at that, the innovation, it's not just an IT issue, not just get the technology and get the data right, there's all this process because the workflows mm. are going to be affected by the applications that either have a gentic or more large scale to them, obviously empowered by the, powered by the data. And it's like, watching a construction of a new bridge to cross the, over to the next, next wave. And while the cars are on it. Now, so you got the one, the old bridge and now the bridge to the future, the AI adventure that you guys are talking about, you got new players like Nvidia. Well, they're an existing player, but you got, you got, well, leader. I mean, the innovative, the innovators yeah. are a new set of players and some existing ones. So the, the customers are seeing this bridge to the future. What, what's the roadmap look like? Cause if I'm the customer, I'm thinking, okay, I love Vast, I love Nvidia, I love what they're doing. It, hangs together with what we're trying to do. What's that bridge look like? Take me through the roadmap, what's next? I'll see Lim, uh, NIMS with NVIDIA, what's that going to enable? What's your vision for what's next? What's on the roadmap? Can you share your thoughts of as this bridge gets constructed to cross into the future, what's that look like? Well, I think actually Cosmos gives you some breadcrumbs to that because um, you know, as, as we point towards this future where you can envision this geo-distributed AI operating system that is basically the runtime for all this, then um, we recognize that customers will have extremely diverse infrastructure and you're going to have just a flood of new embedding models and, um, and, and different types of AI models that come into agentic organizations. And so our objective is to essentially be universal. We want to be on every platform and we want to be in every single data center on-prem or in the cloud that a customer may want to compute in. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to minimize the amount of complexity 
that customers have to deal with so that they can essentially get this thinking machines experience that we're trying to build towards. And so that is um, a ton of work that we have to do on all different levels uh, in order to kind of build out to what customers require for all their data, all their infrastructure, and all the places they want to compute. That, that's, that's a lot of work. Love that thinking machine. It's like, I got to think, I got to learn, I got to get reinforced, and all that is right in line with what's going on with AI. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. if you think about it, uh, you know, you have the data that you have in your organization, those are your memories. You have the new data coming in, those are your experiences. And when you correlate these two, this is when you have realizations. And that's the thing that we're excited about. Well, Jeff, congratulations on an awesome event. And again, continued success. The vast data teams continuing to grow. I know you guys are working on some really big projects as well as plowing plow the fields for the enterprise. Final point, I'll give you the last word for the folks out there watching that are AI builders or people trying to set the table for the future. Mm -hmm. Why vast? Why are you guys relevant? Why vast? Well, uh, if you think about this idea that machines are now working through data at the, at the pace and the scale that NVIDIA is, um, I think it's very clear that legacy architecture concepts aren't necessarily applicative. And so we've been on a mission uh, since day one to, to start from a new foundation that allows people to um, have their data strategy rise up to their kind of application strategy and uh, I think our, our success to date is a little yeah. evidence of the fact that we're doing some things right. So yeah. the, the guidance is don't do it alone. Talk to us about what you want to do, not what you've, the constraints that you kind of have been imposed by infrastructure of yesterday. And uh, yeah. it'll be a fun conversation. A lot of builders on the back end and front end. Jeff, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Sean. This is exclusive coverage here with Jeff Denworth, the co-founder of Vast Data, part of Cosmos, their big program. We're announcing big news here. Up next, the CUBE analysts are going to break down all the action, give their analysis of what's going on with Vast Data. We'll be right back.